Um, I had better start off by explaining my credentials for talking about Hungary. Uh, it goes back a long way. Um, when I was about 20, I got very interested in the Austro-Hungarian army, uh, an old-fashioned romantic subject. And um, it wasn't at all popular. Uh, in, back in 1962, uh, the done thing was to study, well, English history, the origins of the Industrial Revolution, all important. There were people who looked at John Locke and tried to discover Marxist elements in Locke. Uh, and here was I with my Holy Roman Empire and all that. Now, uh, the Habsburg Empire has actually been a very good subject as an introduction to the modern world. Uh, nowadays, they've decided the Industrial Revolution didn't actually happen. Um, and uh, it's those people who now seem obsolete, obsolete, not me. And it's a good subject because, you know, if, if you think about how nationalities have to get on together in some form, Austria-Hungary is a very good place to begin. I was always a bit embarrassed when Archduke Otto, peace to his soul, he was a wonderful man, used to say the Habsburg Empire was a model. It wasn't really. Something went very badly wrong. Now, I asked the British Council, in the days when the British Council did string quartets rather than rock music, um, were there any scholarships to Austria? And they said no. Uh, but something's just come up in Hungary. Uh, they're opening up for a language school in Debrecen. Uh, would I like to go? And I did. And it was fascinating. Um, Budapest was a terrible ruin at the time. The buildings were filthy. They were still pockmarked from 1956 and, of course, the siege. The royal castle in Buda was a ruin. It was hardly lit. There were very few shops open, all that. D dismal communist world. The trams rattled past at six in the morning with uh, poor old workers being dragooned in for a 12-hour day, which began with an hour's propaganda. A dismal, dismal time. But you sensed something going on. That it was, a, it was actually underneath. It was a very interesting place. I won't talk, don't talk about that too much, but um, uh, I kept a weather eye on Hungary and um, picked up a bit of the language uh, and didn't go in the 1970s. Started going in the middle 80s. And they've invited me regularly and said, um, did I want a fellowship to write about Hungarian history? I said, yes, good idea. So I've been there for the last three years. Um, um, now, um, the uh, contrast between Turkey and Hungary, well, uh, the Hungarian population would fit comfortably into Istanbul alone. Um, and uh, if I want to make the point, why Hungary? Um, and this is a, a, a thing which I suggested to Margaret Thatcher when she had to speak about it. I said just, you know, she had to speak to people who probably couldn't find it on the map. And in some maps, it's difficult to find. Um, I will say, say this. This is a country which has got more Nobel Prize winners than Japan. But then say there's a bracket in this. Uh, the really astonishing thing is the high proportion of non-Jews who are Nobel Prize winners, namely 17.5%. Uh, uh, because this is another side of Hungarian history which uh, has to come up in one form or another. Um, now, uh, as Viktor Orban said in a recent speech, uh, his speeches are very good, by the way. Uh, the decisive thing in Hungary is the Austrian border. And if I want to introduce Hungary, I think it's fair enough to repeat this. It's caused three great uh, upheavals uh, which have made the headlines. 
The, the Russians got out of their zone of Austria in 1955. That border then attracted the attention of a lot of Hungarians. And 1956, that, those 10 days of revolt in Hungary, has, they, they have to be seen in that context. And in the course of it, 200,000 uh, of extremely good Hungarians, you must have met them, uh, emigrated to the West. Uh, then comes the next Austro-Hungarian incident, which I won't go on about because it's too obvious, which is the, the, uh, the hole in the Iron Curtain, that marvelous moment when thousands and thousands of East Germans just voted with their feet to get out of uh, Honecker's little hellhole. Um, and that eventually led to the fall of the Berlin Wall and everything else. Again, Hungary. And a couple of years ago, we have the business of the refugees. I mean, I oddly enough saw them uh, in Bodrum, and I saw them when I was on a boat in Kos and Leros, and I saw them again in Budapest as they came tramping through these endless young men camping outside the, the uh, Kelete Pajodvar in, in the railway station in Budapest, going on into Austria, getting that strange ecstatic welcome in Vienna and then, uh, and then in Munich from young Germans. And something, is it a million and a half? Um, now, uh, at the time, the, uh, it, it, there is a good book by a man called Robin Alexander, who's the correspondent of Die Welt, about the circumstances in which Angela Merkel let them in. And it, it is, in a way, a judgment on how the world has treated the whole Nazi episode, that no German was willing to take responsibility for having barbed wire, searchlights, dogs, and the rest of it. They said, oh, what will the world think? So we get a million and a half refugees, and we now get Angela Merkel trying to persuade the Hungarians to take a quota of them in the name of Europe. Now this is, uh, this is um, uh, the splash that uh, Hungary made. <coughs> now I've, I have to say that uh, you know, asking a country like Hungary, which is Still, it's still patches of poverty you can see. Um, you know, you can see old men and women raking through the rubbish in Budapest, a scene which I haven't seen since about 1948 as a small boy in Glasgow in Western Europe, asking them to take in refug refugees or migrants. I mean, think again, this is insanity. Now, I want really to look at um, Hungary from, uh, I think, two big perspectives. Uh, the first one is uh, as a study in post-communism. Uh, the big question comes up about post-communism is how much of it is actually post? And Hungary is quite an interesting case of a strange survival of, uh, of, of communism in, in odd ways. And I, I'm still struck by the contrast between Vienna or, and uh, Budapest. Um, and the other perspective I want to look at is how has Europe handled it? Uh, and th th this is worth thinking about. What has gone right, what has gone wrong? Now, let me start off uh, with an illustration of what I mean about post-communism. After I arrived here last night, I needed to buy some things from the supermarket on the corner, Migros. You go into that place, fresh vegetables, very beautifully arranged, <coughs> everything, useful things, uh, useful things on sale, very attractive and presented. The, the people very helpful with me carrying a stake at the basket. Uh, you know, this is the Turkey which, um, I mean, I've been here for 20 years and uh, I know how it works and it's very impressive. 
it looks, uh, if you go to Ankara, nobody's ever going to make Ankara a pretty city. But it works. The you know, useful shops, people busy doing useful things, selling useful things. You can get a plumber or an electrician to do a good job uh, at, at a moment's notice, this sort of thing. And the contrast between Turkey, I think where Turkey was in 1920, and Hungary, is still pretty striking. So something in, um, uh, uh, something works in, in, uh, in Turkey. Now, uh, um, um, I don't want to boast, really I don't, uh, but I, I can, at a very primitive level, do both Turkish and Hungarian. And they're rather similar language, there's parallels, uh, odd parallels. Uh, in, uh, old words, the word for saddle in Hungarian is nyereg, and in Hungarian it's, uh, it's sorry, in, in Turkish it's eyer, in Hungarian nyereg. The word for tent is shator in Hungarian, chadir in, uh, in Turkish, that sort of thing. And the grammar is rather parallel. And one way or another, the, uh, the Hungarians are rather fascinated by Turkey. And if I, if I muddle up, if I mix the languages, I don't speak either of them at all well. Um, if I muddle the languages, some of the taxi drivers will notice and say, you're a Turk, are you? And I say, no. <laughs> it's a bit difficult to explain. And they say that when they come to Turkey, they're struck by the level of service, the way things work, decency of people, everything like that. They're very nice about the Turks in, um, in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, since you'll allow me a bit of history, uh, in a sense, it's true to say that far from being destroyed by the Turks, Hungary was actually kept in existence by them. Uh, they occupied or controlled in Transylvania, about two-thirds of the country, and the Habsburgs had the rest, the north and west. And uh, if you were under Habsburg rule in 1650, it's the Counter-Reformation. As it applied in Bohemia, the, uh, a lot of Czech things which was wiped out, the foreign nobility came in, all this. Um, Hungary, in Hungary, and it's the big difference between Hungary and pretty well anywhere else, east of Switzerland, Protestantism survived. And it's Protestantism of a kind that I, as a Scotsman, have a sort of cousinly feeling for. If you go into a Calvinist service in um, Budapest, which I, I can't take too much of it, there's, uh, there's two bars of Bach, and then there's uh, a very mournful prayer, and then there's a hymn. And George Bernard Shaw remarked of the communists of the Internationale that it was like the funeral music for a dead sardine. And <laughs> so it is with these hymns. And then the man gets up to speak, and he speaks for an hour and a half. Um, and uh, the church is full. Um, and uh, there we are. And now, that kind of Calvinism, Massachusetts, Geneva, Amsterdam, well, not, not Amsterdam, no, it was always Sin City, um, but uh, much of Holland. Uh, by God, it's a creative force. Now, they're provincial, but they get up in the morning, they read their Bible, they teach. Uh, if they're confronted with vagrants, they whip them out of town. Uh, Calvin devised this in Geneva. He would have a house for people, vagabonds. And if they still did nothing, he put them in a cellar, which gradually filled up with water and gave them a pump. And that way they learned the work ethic. Now that kind of... Uh, <laughs> that kind of, of Calvinism in Hungary sets up um, schools where peasant boys and girls sat down with 
the children of the nobility, much to the nobility's complaint. And Transylvania produced in 1600 the following statistics. Literacy. The Unitarians, 100%. The Calvinists, 85. The Lutherans, 70. Catholics, 30. Orthodox, 10. Um, and this is the kind of thing that goes on. Now, they speak Hungarian. It's archaic. Um, it's very unsophisticated. Uh, but it works hard. And the language really survived there because elsewhere, if you're dealing with the Counter-Reformation Church, although uh, it was never as anything like as harsh in Hungary as it was in Bohemia, because they were frightened of the Protestants and the Turks, uh, the tendency would be simply to slip into German, which in a way is the obvious thing to do. I mean, if you, as the Austrian <coughs> poet Grillparzer remarked later on, why do they hang on to this language? There's only about a million of them that speak it, and they don't write it. Uh, it's got no known close relatives in Europe. Why don't they just sit down and get on with German or something? It's not a nationalist point. I mean, if, if I'm confronted with uh, the business of uh, Celtic languages to be spoken in, uh, in Scotland or Wales, I'm just reminded of a remark of the great Norman Tebbit that uh, Welsh is like a Jurassic Park. You take a fossil, spend a hundred million dollars, and create a monster. <laughs> <laughs> but still, uh, the, uh, after the Turks left, there is a hunger in existence with its old constitution, with its literate population, and then rather oddly in 1800, and this is the side of things where I think I've actually got something positive to add, because the Hungarian historians will never themselves notice it, that in, in effect, reform uh, era in Hungary is driven by Protestants. Uh, and they, they're the ones who remodel the language. And I said I would mention the Jews, and of course Zionism came from Budapest. Well, Herzl did. Uh, and the experience of Zionism, taking a fossil language and turning it into modern Hebrew, is something which Herzl must have known about from Budapest. Because you, uh, you more or less have to invent things for uh, modern words. And the result is that Hungarian is not ne nearly as difficult as you would think because it's copying German a lot of the time. You don't see it in the, in the written text, but if you think of how the Germans build up words, well, uh, poor old Germany, I'm going to give it a bad time. Um, um, the, the word for imagination says it all, selbst Einbildungskraft. <laughs> <laughs> And the Hungarian word is exactly that. They say self in picture power. Uh, it's, it's word for word. And it becomes funny after a bit because you can almost invent Hungarian. But they sat down and they devised, they built themselves up a language with some very powerful poetry in it. Uh, and a country which has really put itself on the cultural map in Europe in a big way as a result of it. I'm, I'm frankly divided about this. Uh, I, I mean, I'm hopelessly in the world of the Scottish Enlightenment and, and really wish that the world would come down to ten languages and not bother with, not bother with anything else. Uh, the tenth, by the way, is Hebrew because you don't want to make an enemy of the Jews. <laughs> and, uh, but still, uh, I can accept, and it's worked in Turkey, I can accept that a vernacular language needs to be built up. There's no way, no real way out of it. Well, um, the reform era, the recreation of the language, education spreads, then come the railways. Uh, things went wrong in 1848 when they went far too far 
against the Habsburgs than they should have done. Then they come right in a way in 1867 when Franz Josef agreed to be crowned king of a sort of semi-independent Hungary. And there followed 50 splendid years. There's a book by John Lukács uh, called About Budapest, which talks about the build-up of this extraordinary place. It's uh, around 1900 when the Hungarian architects get into their stride. It produces some very, very remarkable buildings. And not just Budapest, also in, uh, in trans what's now Romania, Transylvania, uh, some very good buildings indeed. It's a period when, uh, <coughs> when the Hungarian schools, uh, competing with each other, start churning out that, uh, those two generations which hit the world with great force. I think one of the great products of that period, we were talking about it last night, is the memoirs of Arthur Kessler, who's a, a, a Hungarian product. Um, the, the Lutheran school, the Foschor, Foschor Gymnasium, um, it makes a great show of their number of Nobel Prize winners. It's all with tablets all over the place to celebrate it. The Calvinist school, the Jewish ones, the girls' schools, producing troops of oh, musicians, painters. I, 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 I hope I don't need to go on on this subject. It's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's an endlessly interesting thing. Why did Hungary, in effect, produce the atom bomb? I, mean, I suppose you can ask the same question in a way about Russia. They don't have the material to do it. What they are, they have to do is the theoretical physics and the mathematics. Where do they get it from? At any rate, there's, uh, this is the, the period that produces the uh, Hungary of the 20th century. Um, now, then, things go wrong. In 1867, when they made their pact with the Habsburgs and agreed that the Austrians would, that the Habsburgs would be in charge of foreign policy and the army. Uh, Kossuth, the, uh, the big man of 1848, by this stage uh, an exile in, in Turin, wrote an open letter saying, if you give up foreign policy and the military to the Habsburgs, disaster will follow. And in 1914, Hungary was sucked into her Prime Minister protested against it, but couldn't stop it, sucked into the First World War, <coughs> uh, tied to the coat tails of the Germans right to the end, and then Hungary collapsed. There's a communist revolution for a period. And then the uh, Western powers did the, well, with some competition, uh, the Treaty of Trianon is the stupidest of the post-war treaties. Um, it, uh, it, it, it cut the country's size by two-thirds, uh, reduced it to a small Hungarian thing with Budapest, the capital. <coughs> it lost, well, I won't, it, it, it was a permanent force for instability when you've got Hungarians just over the border in Transylvania, in Slovakia, uh, to some extent even in, um, in, uh, in Yugoslavia when you've got this situation, and the, the whole country is, <coughs> is mesmerized by it. <coughs> um, a, a very good recent history of Hungary by an English ambassador, Sir Brian Cartledge, said that the Hungarians, they're not very religious, though no, they're not. Uh, what they are is very nationalistic, if you scratch them. Um, I mean, it's understandable in, in various ways. If, I mean, what does it do to a child? once it grows up, realizing that the language that it speaks has got no possible connection with anything that it sees on foreign televisions or football matches or anything, it must create a very peculiar consciousness somewhere. <coughs> and they are pretty nationalistic. Now, the uh, period between the wars is not a happy one at all. There are some good things that did come out of it, but it's not happy. And uh, Hungary is distinguished 
by having the highest suicide record of, um, of any modern country. It was, I think in 1986, it reached, does 4.5 per 100,000 make sense? Anyway, very high, very high suicide rate. Uh, that suicide rate dropped by two thirds in 1938, when Hungary, in alliance with Hitler, was able to get back some of the lost territories. I don't know what on earth the connection is, but it's always taken as an example of how national morale improved. Now then comes the disasters. Second World War, the Holocaust in Hungary was pretty bad. Um, I mean, I'm sometimes taken to task by people who are hostile to Viktor Orban about the Holocaust in Hungary when, and it's true that roughly, roughly half the Jews, maybe a bit more, went. And they say, that was the fault of the Hungarians. Now, the answer to that is this. Uh, there were six SS officers in Amsterdam. 90% uh, of the Dutch Jews were wiped out. Um, it's not an argument I'm ever happy getting into. How could one be? But I don't think that Hungary was, uh, Hungary was, was worse than anywhere else, shall we put it that way. And the record of Jews in Hungary, the contribution to Hungarian culture and is, it's, it's almost unimaginable. For instance, Bartók, when he made himself unpopular in 1910 by using Hungarian music, native Hungarian music, was almost being going to be thrown out of the concerts uh, and he was protected by a group of mainly Jewish ladies who could understand what he and Kodai were doing. Um, the, I mean, I won't go on on this theme because it's, it's, uh, it is, well, as a, as a friend of mine says, whatever you say about the Jewish, Jewish question in Hungary is wrong. Uh, <coughs> I won't go on on this. Then comes 1945. I'm slightly running ahead, running, can I have another five minutes? Um, and then comes 1945, a viciously bad experience of communism in Hungary. Uh, here's a country which, left to itself, would just have followed some kind of Austrian pattern, prosperous agriculture, ingenious use of energy, that sort of thing. Uh, and instead, it, it, was, it became a kind of appendix of the Soviet Union. Uh, I mean, Khrushchev's idea was to have a vast grain field stretching from the Burgenland to Kazakhstan. Now, a lot of Hungary is only suitable for auctions. So it went down and the workers were dragooned and it comes to the revolt of 1956. And then the Russians sat back and thought, well, we'd better go easy on these Hungarians. And in any case, they're just next to Austria. We can hold up Hungary as some kind of model. And you have this odd phenomenon in the late 60s and 70s of what, in that awful phrase, it was called goulash communism. And you could, uh, you could sell Hungary to the West uh, uh, in, if you brought people to a decent hotel, give them something to eat. The Hungarian ed educated classes were extremely good, read things, sense of humor, everything. And the regime could say, we've got full employment. You don't really see the police on the streets. Here's some literature which is not on our side. And the French journalists in particular would come cooing away and saying, oh, Hungary is like Sweden. Oh, no. um, this um, this uh, happy period started coming apart in 1980. And it did so mainly because they got into a lot of debt. They had the highest debt in the Eastern Bloc per head. And that began to cause troubles. And in 1982, long before Gorby, um, they applied to join the World Bank and the IMF. Now, if you do that, you're accepting certain uh, 
well, I won't say handcuffs, but certain controls. And it meant that the World Bank and the IMF could actually tell them what to do. So you get a mixture of communism and a second economy, as they called it, where people are working very hard for something that looks like real money. Uh, and they actually statistically measure the economy. Uh, it can't really be understood. No one really knows what's happening. Uh, but the trade with the West goes up and up. And the Iron Curtain had really collapsed by in, long before Gorby came, when uh, Pope John Paul did a mass in the, on the Neuseedlersee. 60,000 Hungarians turned up to it. The Iron Curtain was not a reality in Hungary after around that time. But of course, it does mean that you have people who are used to dealing with uh, with uh, what the Germans call Seilschaften, um, of networks within networks, in what is purportedly a communist system. Uh, and it was often described how uh, people could quite legitimately take uh, machinery from factories and use it for private production. Uh, and the, the whole thing became, um, became somehow corrupted. The Hungarians still very divided about this. I mean, as an outsider, I would say they have not much choice. But they have to live with it, and they don't like the consequences. And this is one, uh, this is a context in which Viktor Orban has to be understood, that he's dealing with networks of this sort, which can torpedo what any government would, be, would, would like to do. Uh, he must be understood in that context. Now, um, <laughs> yes, I, mean, uh, I mustn't go on too long. Um, uh, on the other hand, uh, I, I can't miss out uh, uh, a, a, a cultural minister called Odsale. You see, in, um, in Hungary, if you went there from Western Europe, you would find really lively films. The music, the pianist, I don't need to go on about. And there were, you know, serious literary journals. It wasn't like going to Romania or anything of that kind. You could find a lively cultural life. Now, the man behind that was a man called Dörd Jotzil, um, and it's a characteristic Hungarian life. Um, born, in a, born as a Jew in a quarter where there, was no, he, there were no educated people. His father was a carter or something. Uh, he died. The mother remarried. Uh, the husband couldn't bear Gerdot Sale and put him in an orphanage. Um, he got out, uh, was wanted to train as a psychiatrist, couldn't, uh, uh, because there was a law stopping Jews from entering professions. So he became an actor, a very successful actor. Then comes 1944, and his acting skills served him in very good stead because he could ride around in a German staff car. Um, he didn't speak any German, but he could imitate the noise of a German army officer in a very bad mood indeed. And so he, he saved large numbers of people like that. Then subsequently in 1948, uh, he was put in prison by Rakoshi, like so many. After five, six years out, saved by Kadar, and being a man of vast versatility and charm, he would tolerate certain playwrights, encourage certain, certain cinema, and it's uh, through him. And again, obviously through Seilschaften, a certain kind of independent and very interesting cultural life developed in Hungary. Um, uh, I mean, what do you make of a man like that? The Russians hated him, they wanted to get rid of him, but they couldn't quite. Uh, now, <coughs> Something has gone wrong at that level, and it's held Hungary back economically to the point at which it's still behind Austria. Now, the other thing which I, I will gallop through, I think, uh, uh, I mustn't, I'm sorry, I really have to, thanks for being indulgent. Um, <coughs> the other thing is how the Europeans have handled it. And I must say, I just don't think it's been handled intelligently at, at all. Um, Hungary's great strength is agriculture. 
It was a great grain exporter before 1914. The wine, very good. You've all heard of Tokai. Uh, but there are, there are others. Very good at raising pork, this kind of thing. Now, the agriculture is still noticeably behind the Austria. You see the difference on the, on the border uh, and when you leave the Burgenland. You can even see it in Slovakia when you cross over. <coughs> Hungarian agriculture has, has, has somehow languished, as it didn't in the 1980s. Or, um, there's, so the pricing policies and the, and the common agricultural policy have not been working for Hungary's benefit at all. The other side of it, and again I'm afraid to understand Hungarian politics, this has to be said, and it's gypsies. Um, companies like Tesco, big ones, came in, bought up land, subsidized by the European system in one form or another, the village is empty, and are taken over by gypsies. Uh, they make up 20% of the population of Eastern Hungary now. Now, the, uh, I, uh, the Orban government does what it can. I mean, it's got gypsy members of parliament. It encourages a proper kind of gypsy culture. It, it'll get gypsy mayors to try to discipline the gypsies into not producing so many children. But the problem has got out of hand. In communist times, they used to sterilize the gypsy women after three children. The rights of man the European courts don't allow you to do this sort of thing. And the result is that uh, huge numbers of places in eastern, in eastern Hungary are voting for the extreme right party, Jobbik. Uh, and it's to do with problems like this. I don't know what the answer is, but at least the problem needs to be stated. And the other side of Europe is, uh, well, opening the gates. Is it six, seven hundred thousand educated, and I mean the education system is very good, educated Hungarians, energetic, working, you can find them all over Germany and, and, uh, and in England. And what that does to a country to find its, uh, so many of its, uh, of its energetic young people leaving, um, we can only hope that the effect will, the pendulum effect will take place. But meantime, Budapest is left with an awful lot of poor old souls living on pensions, shuffling through the streets with walkers. And the sound you, you hear at night in the big boulevard is ambulances on the way to the hospital. Uh, now, I'm painting a, a pretty gloomy picture, I know. But I think to see what Viktor Orban is trying to do, that, that gloomy picture has to be pictured because he's not responsible for it. If there is a man particularly responsible, it would be his predecessor, a man called Durchan, who actually said at a private gathering, we've done nothing but steal. Mm -hmm. uh, he was silly enough to let it be recorded. And uh, the Europeans went along with this, and they stole too. There's a particularly nasty set of buildings uh, which is no place whatsoever in Budapest, which were put up by the EBRD, the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, Jacques Attali's monstrous, monstrosity. Uh, if you can imagine a McDonald's next to the Astoria Hotel, that says it all, or a hideous glass pavilion next to the National Museum. Uh, this kind of horror was is the, the monument of that period. And, um, <coughs> Whatever you say about Victor, he has done an awful lot to make Budapest the great city that it was. And we can only hope that at some point somebody will be able to write a book about Budapest 1900 and say it's happening again today. I fervently hope so. Thank you.